Sean Bailey, you you did didn't feel the need to criticise the way in which the police handled the Sarah Everard vigil. Why not? Here's what I would say to people about Sarah Everard. I said very early on, this is a, 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 a conversation between the mayor of London, the, the group who want to put on the, the vigil, and Londoners. The mayor should have been there to represent London. He didn't. Instead, he said it's between the government and the police. The mayor will be well aware that he's the police and crime commissioner for but London. But you didn't hold criticise on, the police hold on, tactics. Hold you, on. You, you, hold you, on. I'll tell you, for London, the point I'm trying to make, it maybe it needed to get there. If there was a proper representation, it wouldn't have needed to get there. The mayor should have said, I want this to go ahead, find ways to make it work. The organisers as a vigil have good ideas to make it work. But here's the key thing. The mayor then condemned the police before he had any evidence to condemn them. I never condemn them because I needed the evidence to condemn them. It is more than appropriate to condemn the actions of the police when they're wrong. We have to make sure they're wrong before you go out. Let, let, let's you you said they, the police were completely hold wrong to do what they did. And a, hang on a sec. And an MPCC report that came out later said that the police were absolutely right to conduct themselves in the manner in which they conducted themselves. Do you think you got it wrong? There's a very important point that you've just missed here, which is really important. Somebody aspiring to be the mayor of London has said he would tell the police to find a way to do it. And it's really important because it shows he does not understand the powers of a politician versus the power of the police. Operational matters shouldn't be dictated by a politician. I'm well, quite clear. On, but but, but didn't, you, clear. didn't you just do that oh, by no. saying that the police got it completely I'm, wrong? You're I'm, dictating operational matters. You think the manner in which they handed that Everard vigil was completely wrong. That's no, that's dictating operationally no, what the police I'm should do. I'm giving be. my opinion on operational matter. They're very different, Tom. So, according to Sean Bailey, in advance of, a, of an operational matter, he should he would dictate to the police how to respond. That is wrong. Tom, that, the law. I, I say is two things. If you're sat I've at home, it down. I've written it down. Sat, if you're sat at home now and, you, and you're thinking, Sean said he would have told the police he wants them to help this vigil happen, you are correct. It's exactly what I said. No, you said meant, find a way yes, to do it. find a way. I meant what I said and I said what I meant. But let's be clear, when it suits the mayor politically, he will. Because when it came to Extinction Rebellion, when he thought it'd be um, advantageous to him, he supported them to the hill. Why couldn't he support the women and girls of London to have this vigil at a very important moment for them? I have no idea that who, should have. Whoever the Mayor of London is is also the Police and Crime Commissioner for London. Absolutely. The Police and Crime Commissioner has a legal responsibility for setting the strategic direction of policing in London. What is your strategic direction for policing in London when you were Mayor? Uh, the priority is to reduce uh, uh, violence across uh, London. The priority is particularly to reduce uh, violence where young people are involved, those below the age of uh, 25. The police and crime plan that I published uh, four, four years ago mm -hmm. sets uh, that out. Uh, we're making progress. But I've been honest with uh, Londoners. Uh, I've been honest about the causes of uh, crime. And I was also, at the time you were working for Theresa May, making the point, uh, Tom, that actually cuts have consequences. Mm -hmm. uh, and the point I make is it's really important to understand you can't cut from the police you can't cut from youth services, you can't cut from public services and not expect a consequence. And by the way, it was my lobbying of uh, the successor to your employer, Boris Johnson, who accepted my lobbying and promised to put back 20,000 police officers across the country when more than 21,000 had been cut. And here's the good news. Since I've been elected mayor, because of council tax rates from City Hall and business rates from City Hall, we from City Hall have funded 13,000 additional police officers, but it doesn't replace the officers, the community support officers, the police staff, the police stations, the youth centres, the youth workers who we've lost. But I'm uh, doing my bit to lay the foundations to reduce oh, violent crime. Are oh. you then, hang on a sec, are you then disappointed by the return that you're getting on seeing violence reduced given that 10 teenagers have died in a knife attack in London? Do you think the, the, the Met Police is capable of carrying out your strategic direction? Oh, listen, it's heartbreaking, man. I mean, I, I meet these families both when I was the MP uh, and, and as mayor, and I'm a parent. You know, I, I, I've, I've cried with these parents and, and, you know, that's what that's what motivates me to go even further. And that's why it's really important uh, that you that Londoners choose a mayor who will continue to invest in our police and youth services. And by the way, lepers don't change their spots. Sean Bailey is accepted. He was the youth and crime advisor at, at when the cuts began. He also accepted, by the way, he was very unsuccessful in persuading his bosses to change their minds. Why do we think that things will be different if he becomes the mayor? Sean Bailey. What I accepted is that I started the biggest youth programme this country has ever seen. That's what I accepted. But do you know what would be better, Tom? All of this would be so much easier to believe from the mayor if he wasn't the one as his first act when he became mayor of London was to take £38 million out of the police staffing budget. So if you sat at home now and you think it's all about resources, why did he do that? That guaranteed we'd have a record low number of police officers 
voters into the future. The consequence of having a mayor who had no focus on public safety. He then went on to threaten to take an extra 110 million away from the police, therefore defunding the police and weakening their position on the streets. Would you? So when you ask me yeah. what my plan is for London around crime, it's to make the streets safer by having 8,000 extra police would, officers, would by you? reopening... 38 police stations closed by city. As mayor of London, if you're elected mayor of London, would you extend Cressida Dick's contract? Yes, I don't think Cressida Dick has been our problem. I think Sadiq Khan has been our problem. You're talking about a mayor who said, I've done my bit. You've never done your bit to, to solve crime in London. You're talking about a mayor when he's first talked about, he's offered the idea of a violence reduction unit. He poo pooed the idea. Same no, question you to you, Sadiq Khan. Would you, do you want Cressida Dick in charge of the Met? Yeah, she's done a great job. I'm, I'm really proud uh, to play a role in appointing her. She's the country's first. Uh, in history, our first female commissioner. I'm really proud as the mayor to have appointed the first fire commissioner as a woman, the first met commissioner as a woman, the first chief officer of City Hall who's a, a woman, and that's what it means having a proud feminist in City Hall. We've got the world's first ultra-low emission zone, and so there's been a 97% reduction in schools in areas where the area is unlawful. There's been a 94% reduction in homes where the area is uh, areas You're unlawful. You're going to extend that, Ulysses, in, aren't you? Well, let me tell you the, the benefits first, Tom. Uh, we've seen in central London, uh, the toxic air reduced by a half across London by a, a third, but also by having a five-fold increase in cycling by encouraging people to walk by freezing fares for five years, saving the average household £200. We've improved the quality of air in London. And Tom is right. I do want to extend the ultra-low emissions and, and that comes to the circular cost. and... That, com that comes at a cost to the, to, to I mean, the users. I mean, of let the me cost. finish Alexi's question with respect, Tom. Uh, I do want to extend, Alexi, the North Circular, the, the, the uh, Ultra Emissions up to the North Circular and South Circular, but also get more walking and more cycling so we can continue to improve okay. the quality of area London. Sean Bailey. Alexi, I think the mistake the mayor has made here is to charge people to answer our poor air quality question in London. So every time you hear about fixing the air, all of a sudden the poorest people in London are landed with a new bill. What the mayor should do is what I plan to do, is to make the entire bus fleet green. That's the equivalent of taking 1.1 million cars from the road from an air quality. Well, where are you going to get the money to do that? It's already wrapped up in a bus contract and it's the same no, 130... Well, hold on, hold on. It's the same 130 million pounds we're going to have to spend just putting cameras in. Okay. Cameras that will very shortly become out of date. If you want to clean the air up in London, it's, it's, it's common sense. If something is putting out dirty air, you remove the source. You don't just charge Londoners more and more and more money sure. to exist in London. If that money's wrapped up, sure. why haven't you done it? Sure. It's really important for you to disentangle this. Sean Bailey has said it'll cost £180 million to green out buses, right? Uh, Sean, how many buses... I absolutely did not say that. I said it'll cost you £130 million to put cameras in. Okay. That's what I said. How many buses in London? 9,000. How much does an electric double-decker bus cost? 240 grand. 400,000. Times 9,000 by 400,000. What does it come to? Tell me. 3.6 billion. Where's the money, Sean? You get the money out of the system. We buy new buses. Three point six we billion buy. pounds anybody in three years. Anybody listen to this now? Anybody listen to this now would be would see. Oh, the mayor clever. He knows it. No, he doesn't. We buy new buses all the time. The bus contractors do them. And when we will sign the contracts, we will sign to that contract that you bring a new busing as speedily as possible. The idea that I'm saying that City Hall should buy all the buses is ridiculous. The point is this: Yeah, we need to take action that actually cleans the air in London, not action that costs you as Londoners. Remember, he wants to extend the ultra low emission zone. He wants to bring it out to London border tax. He's raised council tax by 31% across his term because the mayor has failed to control the finances of Nine. London and he's making you at home pay for it. I'm going to chuck, some, I want to I'm going to chuck some numbers in as well. 99% of Londoners still live in areas exceeding the World Health Organization limit for PM2.5, the particularly harmful residues from exhausts and also tyre and brake wear. 99%. Well, firstly, I know you want to run away from the fact that Sean can't do maths. And, he's, and, and <laughs> the, the, nearer, the nearer we get to the election, the more fantastic and remarkable his promises become. Let me deal with that. That's a particular matter. And that's why, by the way, I've been lobbying the government in the new uh, bill going through Parliament to make to use the WHO definition mm -hmm. of what the particular matter should be, the 2.5 model. That's one of the reasons we've done so. And by the way, that's a particular matter. As far as nitrogen dioxide is concerned, because all our buses now in London are ULS compliant, we've reduced by more than 90% the amount of toxic emissions from our buses. Do you, you talk about politics being conducted in a manner that voters would like to see happen. You talked about that happening outside of an election. Do you two get on? For me, this is just, it's just not personal. It's just not that way. I don't, like, if you come to the London Assembly where I'm a member, we, the Labour, the Green, everybody, even, even the baggies, we all get on. We try to achieve goals. Mm. I've never seen this as personal. It's just not like that for me. Do uh, you uh, respect Sean Bailey uh, and, and, the, and the campaign he's running? I find some of the views he has about women, about girls, about people like me who celebrate Eid, about my Hindu friends who celebrate Diwali, 
about poor Londoners, about multiculturalism. Multiculturalism, I find them offensive, uh, and so I can't like this guy. Uh, but he's not my enemy, he's my opponent. And so the way we carry ourselves is really important. So what I won't do is personalise this against uh, Sean Bailey, his family, his ethnicity or his religion. Can I ask you about that, Sean Bailey? You, um, the, the, Salik Khan talks about what you'd said around Eid. You wrote for uh, the CPS think tank in 2005, I speak to people from Brent and they are having Muslim and Hindi days off. What it does is rob Britain of its community. You've also said you think it is easier for black people to integrate based on the fact they're more likely to speak English. What it was about is I come from a very poor community that um, that suffers hugely. We're always really trying to separate it out, always trying to keep us away from school, always trying to keep us away from moving forward. And my big thing, if we're going to do well here, you've got to integrate, you've got to get involved. And why should we always be the chosen victim? Why do we always have the ones, poor health outcomes, poor employment outcomes, all of those things? And that was a conversation that I was having with my community. And it's very interesting that people in our ivory towers pulling things out of context who have no idea what it's like to be born of the street, raised of the street in London, have to cope with those situations. Can I just say, I was raised on a council estate. I also came from a poor community. I've never held those views. Do you, do you, do you step back from those views now? I've always told people, look, You don't think these views I, I, now I've represent who you people are, that, or you still have this a, opinion? That was a long time ago. It's a different conversation. And of course, if anybody's offended, I've apologised profusely. But the real thing here is, what does that mean for my understanding of crime now? Why the mayor is completely misunderstood and crime's risen in communities? Because he doesn't understand the conversations that people are having. He doesn't understand the impact of having people in your community who are not pursued because he made cuts to the police. Let me ask All you, of these things make it harder for poorer communities in London to move forward. Let, let me ask you about the race report. Do you think, Sadiq Khan, that London displays systemic racism in parts there's two parts to this and they're not they're not necessarily uh contrary to each other one is yes there has been huge improvements in our city and our country over the last 40 years when my dad arrived in this country there were signs in b and b's in guest houses and pubs saying no blacks mm. no irish no dogs within a generation his son is the mayor of the city so of course there's been progress but there is institutional racism there is structural racism and the government report two weeks ago is a joke and I'm surprised that Sean Bailey who claims he stands up for our city you haven't heard a peep from him criticizing the government or their report do you think it? Do you think it's a joke? This race report. There, there's two things. It's interesting how busy the mayor is putting words in my mouth. Like, that's always interesting to me. I think you should. Well, say your own words. So, so here's the thing. The report was a report. It doesn't make any difference to people on the ground, but it tried to signify some of the the, the progress that is made. I was born in areas as a great big NFL voice. We used to spend all our time running away from the NF. Those sort of things don't happen now. But we st still do have structural racism that affects young black people. If you look, for instance, about graduate unemployment more than double in the black community. So there's challenges to be made, but to ignore some of the progress, to turn this report into a wholly political thing so we don't have the conversation about progress, I think has been wrong. I speak to black people and what they focus on is a statute commission. They say, for instance, that has been hugely divisive. They feel that it's set back our relationship in, in, the, in, the, in the city and that's something that was instigated by Sadiq Khan. So it, it, these things swinging roundabouts, I know that the black community are focused on progress mm -hmm. and this report is just a small part of that. We Yes, in between March 2019 and 2020, uh, 13,523 affordable homes uh, were built in that year. That is a record for City Hall. And yet, uh, it, you have started, Sadiq Khan, less than half of the affordable homes you promised to build by 2023. No, because the, 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 the deal we have with government is every year we start a certain number of homes, uh, Kate. And the good news is, not only have we met the targets from the government, we've exceeded them. Uh, and the, the idea is, because we're a standing start, Kate, the first, the year, the first year I became mayor, in the year before, only 7,000 homes had been begun. The good news is, we broke the record the following year, 12,500. We broke the record again, 14,500. We broke the record again last year, 17,200. And we're on course to continue increasing. And every year, Kate, we're breaking records. But, and here's the but, we can't build the homes we need unless the government gives us more support because the market won't provide the council homes that you so desperately need. Uh, and so, uh, but, but that's uh, so why that's why you've got to set up something on your own. And Kate, if this was all about money, why are we sitting on half a billion pounds? It's sat there. It could be out in the market. It could be providing homes. But instead, it's sat there. We need a fresh we need a fresh direction. And we need to do things differently, Kate. That's why I'm suggesting we start up something in situ. We become developer. We're not beholden to developers. The mayor has been beholden to developers his entire mayoralty, and it's meant absolutely just record lows. We just haven't seen anything like the numbers that he promised us, not even close. Well, I think there's clearly a vault at City Hall I've not found where there's money that Sean Bailey's going to use.